What on earth were you thinking? Izuku's mother yelled hysterically. Izuku winced, cringing away from the critical eyes all around him. It seemed no matter how old he was, Izuku still feared his mother's disappointment, while Skatsuki pointedly ignored his mother's glare. They were gathered in the elder hut, the oldest and strongest structure in the tribe. It was built in the era of All Might and held in great reverence. The wooden frame had withstood great storms, and the Kazahana tribe believed that the spirit of Yagi Toshinori still inhabited the sacred ground. Izuku, Katsuki, and Tasaki were ordered there, so they may discuss the incident involving you. Chief Sana sat in his glorified throne that held two menacingly large mammoth tusks framing the wooden seat. It was an intimidating place of power. However, Sana seemed as though he'd rather be anywhere else than watching two mothers bury their sons. And you, Katsuki, charging up to it? What were you thinking? Mitsuki fumed. Katsuki rolled his eyes. Tuh. It listened to Deku. I knew it was a big wuss. He caught Izuku's timid glance, but remained unfazed. He couldn't afford to give any life to the possibility that he'd known about you or helped you with these actions. Though Katsuki was usually crass and rude to everyone who came in contact with him, the tribe was aware that with Izuku, that behavior was a bit more deliberate. They thought a hatred existed between the two boys. And that's exactly the angle Katsuki decided to play. To have everyone believe that Bakugo Katsuki, through his pride and prejudice for Midori Izuku, refused to be one-upped by a magicless nobody. That he'd acted to de-glorify whatever would be impressive of Izuku taming a beast from the forest and pull the glory for himself. His actions, reckless, impulsive and arrogant, were completely in the frame of how they viewed him and the perfect cover for what had really happened. Mitsuki smacked Katsuki over the head and he gritted his teeth to refrain from reacting with curses. Don't roll your eyes at me. Sometimes I swear. Just wait until your father gets back. Katsuki smothered the urge to sigh obnoxiously at the lame threat. His father would only calmly lecture him about monster safety. Not so much frightening, but guaranteed to bore him to death. Sana did sigh. Tiredly. In any case, all your actions were foolish. Midoriya, you know very well that the tribe does not interfere with the creatures of the forest. Why ever you would fraternize with that beast is beyond me. I would think, considering your social status, you would try to keep a lower profile, but that does not seem to be the case. Izuku bowed his head in embarrassment, his eyes drifting to the ground to avoid looking at anyone. Sana turned to Tisaki. And you, for you to bring that thing back to our home, was nothing short of idiotic. Who knows what it could have done, what it's capable of, what possessed you to endanger the lives of everyone here? Tisaki clenched his fist, but replied in a polite tone. I'm sorry. I did not think my plan through. When I saw Deku with the beast, I acted. I did not want to come without it, should someone doubt my words that Deku is conspiring with the beast in the forest. Izuku blurted, I am not conspiring with them. Sana held up his hand and Izuku quieted instantly, biting his lips with nerves. Nevertheless, you are not to see this creature again. Whether you are conspiring with it or not, prove your innocence and stay away. I do not wish to hear of this again. Is that understood? Izuku's emerald eyes saddened but he nodded. Yes, Chief. Katsuki caught the pitying gaze Sana cast on him, and it struck Katsuki that the Chief had not asked Izuku just what he was doing with you in the forest, that he didn't entertain Tasaki's theory at all. Katsuki suspected it was because Sana knew that Izuku had no friend amongst the tribe, and decided not to judge him so harshly on finding one beyond. Finally, Sana turned his tired eyes on Katsuki, he exhaled exasperated. Bakugo, though stupid, it was very brave of you to scare the creature away. While I would suggest you act with a little more caution in the future, you help keep the peace. I commend you. It is good to have such brave warriors guarding us. Katsuki inclined his head briefly in respect and added a little of his usual cockiness when he replied, Thank you, Chief. Sana dismissed them. That is all.
Outside the elder hut, Katsuki watched Inko drag Izuku behind her. She was sprightly despite her stature and buzzing with anxiety. Anyone with a gift of sight could see where Izuku got his nervous energy from, with the way she wrung her hands and words poured from her mouth like a fountain. Izuku glanced back, barely a millisecond, but Katsuki caught the grateful and relieved glint in his eyes. Katsuki looked away impassively. He'd done his part. There didn't have to be anything more than that. Mitsuki stormed off with her own rant, but Katsuki paid her no heed. He was an adult, and unlike Izuku, didn't give a fuck what his mother had to say about his poor life choices. The sun had sunk an hour before, and Katsuki was intent on heading home to sleep off the day's stressful events. If the annoying freak that was Tasaki didn't decide to yank him by his arm to the side of the elder hut. What was that? he demanded vehemently. Katsuki blinked, letting annoyance bleed into the red of his eyes and pierce into Tasaki. Let go of my arm before I blow it up. Tasaki let go, though reluctantly. You let the beast go, he said, his brown eyes burning with anger and accusation. Subtlety would not be Katsuki's friend here. He growled, opening his palms in threat. Are you out of your fucking mind? You should be groveling at my feet for fixing your fuck up, but you're accusing me of letting that mutt go? Tesaki took a step back, his eyes flickering to Katsuki's palms. Katsuki knew that Tesaki wouldn't pick a physical fight with him. He knew that he'd win. This was just frustration talking, and by the looks of it, that feeling was quickly running out. Katsuki grinned widely. What's wrong, Fingers? he asked mockingly. Upset your dumb plan to get recognized by the tribe backfired? Go fucking cry about it. It ain't my fault you picked Deku and his overgrown guppy to do it. So don't go blaming me for your bullshit. Katsuki mashed his shoulder into Tasaki as he walked past. Hard enough for the weakling to fall to the ground. He didn't stay long enough to hear Tasaki say under his breath, This isn't over. Bakugo. Of all the idiotic things Katsuki had watched you do growing up, this had got to take the win. It was obvious that you and Izuku were trying to pop the blood vessel at his temple with your foolishness. Katsuki gritted his teeth as he marched over to where the entire back half of your beastly form was sticking out from some bushes at the very edge of the tribe's borders. Oi, dumbass! You forget how large you are! Katsuki spat lowly. He wanted to yell, but that would just bring attention to you if there were any guards nearby. When you startled and jolted with surprise, it aggravated Katsuki more. Were you just not paying attention to your surroundings? How careless were you being? Had it been anyone else, they may have killed you with no hesitation. Katsuki counted himself lucky to be the one to find you. When your eyes met his, you shift to human. Before you utter a sound, Katsuki orders, Get out. You've caused enough trouble as it is. You don't leave, instead taking a step forward into his space and looking at him with those beautiful, pleading eyes that hadn't aged a day since he'd left. Katsuki, please. I haven't seen Izuku in two weeks. No messages, nothing. I just need to know what happened, if he's okay. The worry in your voice irked him, though not in the way that matched the words he spoke. What? Can't survive a few days without your boyfriend? Your eyes narrow with slight puzzlement, but all you say is, Izuku is family. Katsuki huffed irritably. Nothing happened to Deku. We don't hurt our own. He'd meant for the statement to be a jab to you, to isolate you as other, but that was not how you took it. Your eyes steeled and you straightened. Is he? You asked. What? Your own, you say icily, because he certainly doesn't seem like it. You got something to say, Mutt? Katsuki growled. He advanced, his face mere centimeters from yours and glaring with dare. Anyone else would have backtracked or cowered when faced with the looming, bottled aggression of Bakugo Katsuki waiting to pop. But not you. You'd always been different. You and Izuku both. 
You glared right back at him. Your features shifted, your eyes turned feral, and your teeth sharpened with lethal intent as you spat fire at Katsuki. No one here has ever treated Izuku like a person. He tells me about how this tribe treats him, how you treat him. Izuku isn't your own, he's my own, and I need to know if he's okay. Katsuki hadn't gotten a good look at you when Tisaki pulled his stunt. Only a short glimpse through the panic. But he could see all of you at that moment. Could see how you'd grown and how much had remained the same. Could feel how your fierceness still calmed the volatile nature of his heart. Softened it like it was merely clay for you to shape. Not that he could let any of those feelings show on his face. Not after everything. He stepped back, holding a skull. If I tell you where he is, will you leave? Your eyebrows furrowed, likely from how easily Katsuki had conceded. Yes? He's fine. He got an earful from the chief and his mother, but he got off easy. He's been forbidden from seeing you, Katsuki stated. Katsuki saw the way you saddened, the loss of tension in your limbs and the mist in your eyes. Does that mean he's never coming back? You asked too soft and vulnerable, like a child's. Like the way you'd asked all those seasons ago in the midst of a windstorm, sheltered by the wolf's den. Are you leaving? And fuck if that didn't tug painfully at Kalski's heart. He looked away from you, exhaling to feign annoyance because he couldn't look into your eyes and fight the urge to wipe that fragility away. I'm sure your boyfriend will find his way back to you eventually. They're going to stop having interest in his useless ass. Why do you keep saying boyfriend like that? You ask, puzzled. Like what? I don't know, you shrugged. Like, boyfriend means more than just friend who is a boy. Katsuki narrowed his eyes, watching the confusion on your face before the realization hit him. He smacked his forehead. Oh, for fuck's sake. Did Deku not teach you this stuff? What stuff? You say, irked by his condescending tone. Katsuki groaned internally. Of course the shy nerd would neglect this part. Nothing, just go away before Tasaki comes back. He's already suspicious. Tasaki, the one who captured me? You questioned, tensing with alertness. Yes, he's an annoying snitch. I think he suspects I know you. You nod with understanding. Well, I wouldn't want you to get in trouble. I'll get going. Just if you see Izu, I'm not your fucking messenger boy. Katsuki snapped suddenly. Look, let's get one thing straight. I helped you for my own interest because it made me look good, not because I care about you. Your eyes widen at the outburst, but then turn stony. You huff through your nose. I'll never understand what happened to you, Katsuki. You used to be this amazing boy who actually gave a damn about your friends. How could you become this? I grew up, Katsuki said harshly. Maybe it's about time you and Deku grow up too. You roll your eyes. Whatever, Katsuki. You know you. You stopped. Katsuki watched the hurt he'd left you with enter your features as though it was still fresh. Like a bleeding wound nobody had catered. There were a million words hidden in your irises, but all that left your mouth was, I'm happy you got everything you wanted. And that stung worse than all the things he expected you to say. In the next second, you shifted and pounced into the bushes, leaving Katsuki to stare after you with a hollow heart. It takes weeks for Izuku to become a ghost again, for the eyes to stop finding him even if he was tucked away in the furthest corners, for the talk, both loud and hushed, to simmer down, for the tribe healer to allow him some liberties as he did before, instead of painstakingly hand-copying his manuscripts for hours each night because he did not want his patients to come in contact with him in the day. The day Izuku realized things were as they were before the tribe found you, he waited an extra three days to ensure he was able to drift unseen amongst his people. He never thought he'd be so thankful for being ignored again. 
On that night, he snuck out of the tribe. He took an unlikely route, one that led him far into the forest towards the large hill adjacent to the tribe. To anyone following, he would look to be wandering aimlessly. However, he knew from the many explorations with you that the hill possessed a small gateway, a gap in the rocks that was not so easily seen by those who did not know of its existence. The hidden path cut an arch into the hill, allowing for an easy escape if you were quick enough not to be seen. This detour took more time than he would have liked, but he had no other choice. He would not risk your safety again. Entering our place was like coming home. Though it seemed a little more of a mess than when he'd last left. Nothing major, just a small pile of animal bones gathering and other odds and ends. Izuku approached soundlessly, thinking you may be asleep, what with nobody to wake you at sunset. He had amused himself these past few weeks that at the very least you could sleep however long you wished without him there as your rooster. But you were not asleep. Instead, you were perched at the edge of your nest, stabbing dejectedly at the coals in the heart, appearing positively forlorn. You stared at the red hot coals, so deep in your thoughts you hadn't even sensed his presence. It would seem that all Izuku's fantasies of you enjoying yourself in the forest was a far stretch from reality. Izuku plastered a wide smile on his face before saying teasingly, I didn't think you'd miss me this much. You startled, straightening in alertness. Your eyes find him and he watches the light return to them, like the first burst of sunshine over the horizon. You jumped him, screaming with joy. Izuku, I missed you so much. Your arms around him squeezed tightly, locking as though they had no intent to ever let go again. Izuku was sure you were cutting off his blood flow, but he hugged you back with all his strength. Having you here, flesh and warmth, in his arms after weeks apart, made him happier than finding all the treasures of the world would. I missed you too, he said softly into your hair. You pull away, however cling to his arm. You tug him towards the inside. Come on, let's eat, and you can tell me all about... Izuku stayed rooted. You fall to in confusion. Izuku smiled sadly. I can't stay. The happiness drains from you as swiftly as it had come. What? Why? Izuku hated to do this, but he knew it was necessary. I'm sorry, Poppy, but the tribe is just forgetting about everything that happened. I don't want to risk them getting suspicious of me again. If they do, they'll follow me here. We have to be more careful than we've ever been. Your eyes turn glossy, and you look down to avoid his gaze. Oh. Izuku pulled you back into a hug. Hey, it's not going to be for long, only until I'm sure it's safe. I'll come back as often as I can. You nod into his chest, clinging tightly. Promise? Izuku pressed his lips to the top of your head. I promise, Poppy. I'll always come back to you. Tribes were created out of necessity, from people who discovered that there is safety in numbers. Each person was given a task for the smooth running of the collective group. People hunted, gathered, built all for the need to survive. So where did people go for leisure? The small town of Tenoshi was popular amongst the surrounding tribes. The markets were common ground for trade amongst each other and foreigners bringing rare and intriguing items from faraway lands. The two functioning brothels were the only for miles and miles, and heavily taken advantage of if you had the gold to spend. And if not, you could drown your sorrows in the lively taverns for a couple of coppers. As of late, it was where Tasaki had found himself. He'd drink and drink until he could forget his failure how he'd been unable to find you again, or prove that Katsuki had been involved prior to the incident. He'd stalked Izuku and Katsuki for hours, only to find them going about their daily tasks 
as though nothing had happened. He searched the forest, close to where he'd spotted you the first time, and still nothing. He'd even followed Izuku into the forest once, but lost sight of him. When he caught sight of him again, moments later, he had a fistful of herbs and confusion written on his face. Not meeting with his beast, but apparently collecting herbs for the tribe's healer. Tisaki downed his drink in misery. It had been his chance to prove to be more worthy than the golden boy, Katsuki, and it had all gone to shit. He'd been coming here since he'd given up, preaching his woes to anyone near enough to hear. He never thought, through his ailed mind, that someone was truly listening. Though tonight, there was. Someone that would throw your life into chaos was listening intently to every word the drunken man spewed. He approached Tasaki, cloaked in black, and sat at his table. I hear you've seen a great beast in the forest. Tasaki focused his blurry vision on the figure. Who's asking? He slurred. The stranger pulled his hood back, revealing snowy hair and glittering silver eyes. I am. Please allow me to buy you a drink. 